Oh, gracious God, that is our declaration. That is our song. What could we give in exchange for a soul? What could the world and all of its sorry treasures possibly be worth compared to the surpassing value of knowing you? So we sing these songs eager to hear from you in your word this morning, eager to be conformed to your image, eager to grow into the maturity which befits the stature of the fullness of Christ together. We thank you for your word in our own language. We thank you for your truth conveyed. And we submit under it. We hear and we are eager to do what would please you. Help us this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit to yield and to rejoice in what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And I would invite you to turn to what is no doubt becoming familiar territory. We're in a lengthy section in Romans chapter 14. On Friday morning, John was uh, teaching in the trust and uh, through a series of home remodeling projects had injured his hands and was bleeding profusely into his Bible. Uh, I was reminded with the imagery there of those who bled, spilled their blood, gave up their lives so that we could have a Bible in our own language. And then, of course, I thought of our friends in Papua New Guinea on the other side of the world doing that very thing even as we speak. And the chronological teaching for the Doe people in Maui Roro continues. And our team there is laboring to put God's word in their language. What a rich treasure. A rich treasure we have on our own laps. The ability to know God's mind in our language. And what a rich privilege it is to partner with our friends laboring for that. Uh, even as Tyndale and others labored on our benefit 500 years ago. So it's a privilege to look at Romans 14. This is now a passage we've been in for some time. And we're going to be looking this morning at beginning in verse 19 through the end of chapter 14. So look along with me and we'll read the text together. God writes here through the Apostle Paul, So then, verse 19, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats Because his eating is not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. Becoming a Christian is rather an easy matter. I mean, all you have to do is completely abandon everything that you are, totally surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, take up your cross and follow him. It's easy. A total annihilation of who you used to be and everything upon which you used to depend. A repudiation of your own inherent goodness, so-called. A repudiation of every human attempt to remedy the situation of your sin and do away with guilt. The walking away from every form of man-made religion to try to salve conscience or improve behavior. Becoming a Christian means walking away from all of that. It means fundamentally walking away from you. And it's as easy as it was for Lazarus to walk out of a tomb, his own tomb, after having been dead four days when Christ so commanded. There was power in the word of Jesus Christ, Lazarus come forth, and there is power in the word of Jesus Christ, the one who said, let light shine out of darkness, let light be, and light was. There's that kind of power 
Every time the human heart turns from emptiness and vanity and a hamster wheel of endless religion and effort to simple faith in Jesus Christ. Becoming a Christian is, of course, impossible, (laughs) humanly speaking, naturally speaking, but it is simple supernaturally. It is always miraculous, and if you are in Jesus Christ here this morning, you have experienced supernatural power, having been born from above, having been raised from the dead, having been reconciled to God by the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. And the simple facts of Jesus' death in our place, what Jake was reading for us this morning, God loved us, Jesus gave himself up for us are facts that can be apprehended and understood by a child. And yet they are impossible to believe savingly without a supernatural work of God. We've all benefited from that supernatural work. And in becoming a Christian, you not only have been placed into union with God, union with Christ, indwelt by His Holy Spirit, As an individual, you have also been placed by His Holy Spirit into a body, a local fellowship of believers, the church. You have been placed by God into an organism, an interdependent organism that is connected in its parts. And we rely on each other in that. And when we get together as a body of Christ, we realize fairly quickly that we are all not clones. We are, in fact, very different. We come from different backgrounds. We've walked with Christ some longer than others. Some have pursued Christ harder than others. We all have varying weaknesses and strengths. We all have varying interests. We all have various backgrounds, sins in our pre-Christ days or sins we have labored to put to death in the Christian life. And each one is running his or her own race. But all of these race runners are put together in one organism, interconnected, interdependent, the body of Christ. And so we find amongst ourselves these differences. And many of our differences are differences in areas that we call indifferent. That is, they're indifferent to specific or explicit commands of Scripture. We've called these preference areas or gray areas. And not everybody is the same in the way they approach various areas of indifference in the Christian life. And it's as if Paul knew, or it's as if God knew, as he wrote this section for us, that we would need to dwell here for a little while, (laughs) because we're different from one another, and our differences rub against each other, and we struggle at times to figure out, is this a biblical command, or is this a preference, is this an area of liberty, an area of freedom, an area of Christian conscience? And these things are not easy. And we cannot simply stop with the question, can I? Can I eat this meat? Can I do this activity? We must go further than that and ask the question, what do my activities, what do my choices mean for others in the body of Christ to whom I am connected? You see, my preferences, my liberties, my exercise of freedoms in Christ are not all about me. They are about my brothers and sisters that I am connected to in the local church. And we have to think along those lines. The Christian life is not a solo lobo, lone wolf life, but a life lived in a family, in a body, with others? How do my actions affect others in the church? Discovering what is and what is not a freedom is not your guide for activities. Your guide is love. Love for God and love for others. 
So it should be no surprise that Paul is dealing with this at length. And I want to read a parallel passage. You can hold your finger in Romans 14, but we need to look at 1 Corinthians 8. Because there Paul draws out in more specific detail a very specific application of the principles we've been seeing in Romans 14. And at some point we were going to jump over to this parallel. This morning is a good time to do that. Beginning in verse 4 of 1 Corinthians 8, Paul addresses the Corinthian church with some very similar principles, but honing in on a very specific application. He writes, therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols. There it is very clearly. Instead of giving the general principle, Paul is jumping right into the specific application from which we draw the principle. Eating things sacrificed to idols. He says, verse 4, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world. And Scott Demarest would say, wait a second. I was with Smed in the Tibetan regions of western China and we actually went into an idol factory and we saw people producing idols. (laughs) Yes, of course there are idols. But they're nothings. They're nothings. They're, They're made by humans. They are dependent on humans for their manufacture and for their sustenance. And for Tibetans, they they feed the idols. In other words, they put food in front of the idols and then the food rots because the idol doesn't eat it. And they have to throw the food away and replace the food as they continue to feed the idol. The idol does nothing. It's manufactured by men. It's dependent for its existence and its so-called sustenance upon humans. And yet humans bow down in front of it and worship it and beg for it to provide for their lives. And we know that there's nothing behind the idol other than the fact that Satan and his henchmen demons are behind all false doctrine, doctrines of demons, and idolatry is a satanically funded, rooted, and programmed religion. But the idol itself is nothing. Paul affirms that here. And so meat sacrifice to idols is a sacrifice to nothing. There's a nothingness in it. There is only one God. Verse 5, even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for Him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through Him. However, not all men have this knowledge, but some and he's talking about Christians here in the church at Corinth, being accustomed to the idol until now, eat food as if it were sacrificed to an idol. Every time I went to that market and bought a steak, it was the result of idol worship. It was sacrificed to that idol, and it was eaten in the practice of idol worship. I don't know steak any other way than by idolatry. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But food will not commend us to God. We are neither the worse if we do not eat, nor the better if we do eat. But take care that this liberty of yours, the liberty to eat a steak or not eat a steak, that came from an idol factory, take care that this liberty of yours do not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if someone sees you who have knowledge, dining in an idol's temple, will not his conscience, if he is weak, be strengthened to eat things sacrificed to idols? He grew up his whole life eating meat sacrificed to idols. That's where he got his steak. It has all those associations. He sees you there eating that steak, and he violates his own conscience to follow your example. He hasn't been informed. He hasn't had his conscience renewed in this area. And through your knowledge, verse 11, he who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. And so by sinning against the brethren and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, Paul says, if food causes my brother to stumble, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause my brother to stumble. The same principles we've been looking at in Romans 14, but obviously narrowed into the very specific application of meat sacrificed to idols. What Paul's going to do for us next in Romans, uh, at the end of here of chapter 14, is give us six more directives 
to govern our use of Christian liberties. Six more directives to govern our use of Christian liberties. And as I said a couple of weeks ago, these principles, these instructions, these imperatives, they need to be forged in our hearts as personal convictions. A sort of operating manual in the body of Christ in dealing with one another in areas indifferent. The first command here in our text this morning is found in verse 19. It is pursue peace and mutual edification. Look at verse 19. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up of one another. Uh, My New American Standard Bible reads, we pursue. I I think there is good ground to read that as an imperative. Let us pursue where Paul is enjoining himself and others together in this corporate command, let us pursue. I think that is the right way to read this text. If you read it as we pursue, Paul is laying it out as the normal Christian experience. This is what we should expect in the Christian life. And so either way you take it, it still has the force of a command. This is normal Christianity, pursue peace and mutual edification. So if you're not doing it, you should. Or command Let's pursue peace and mutual edification. To pursue here is a strong word. It means to run after. It means to chase something. It's the word that's often used for persecution. That is to chase after so as to persecute somebody. In other usage, it means to chase, to run rapidly and decisively in pursuit of something that is elusive. To pursue here is not to think about peace and mutual edification. Uh, Not to just ponder it from time to time. Not to kind of wish for it. Boy, wouldn't that be nice? You know, the, the beauty pageant contestants every time when they're asked, what do you want for the world? They say, I want world peace. (laughs) Uh, We're not just to sit around like a beauty contestant hoping for something. No, we are to pursue it, to chase it down. This is not a jog or a stroll. This is not speed walking. It is to run rapidly and decisively in pursuit of something. A number of years ago, I read a a news article about a doctor in Flagstaff who is commuting every day to work in Phoenix. You've driven that path, I-17. That's not an easy commute. He had a Lamborghini, black. He blacked out the headlights, blacked out the taillights, turned his lights off, drove in the dark, and had no license plate. The police did not like that. He would weave in and out of traffic. It was like the Batmobile in the middle of the night, nearly invisible. And he made a really quick commute out of Flagstaff to Phoenix. A very dangerous commute. And so the Fuzz was hot on his tail. (laughs) They were in hot pursuit of this Lamborghini, and they couldn't keep up, though they tried for months. And they tried to trap him. They tried to catch him. They knew where he was going to be, when he was going to be. And for months, he eluded them. But as in such cases, the the more you elude the police, the more they want to get you. (laughs) And they got him. And he went to jail. What is it like to pursue things like peace and mutual edification in the church? It means to use significant effort to chase rapidly that which is oftentimes elusive. Are we to hurry up as a Christian and find out what I'm allowed to do in the Christian life so that I can get on with my individual liberties? No, friends, we are to hurry up and expend our resources to find out how to chase after peace. We have vertical peace with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that vertical peace with God and our union with Him has put us into union with each other. And what is demanded here is a horizontal peace with believers. We are to be in hot pursuit of a pair of very important things. This peace with each other, 
is so critical. What are you doing, Christian, to pursue peace with your brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you realize that it takes a radical death to self? You have to put aside self-interest in order to pursue peace with others. If two people are with each other, each fighting for their own rights, their own preferences, (laughs) there will never be gained any ground. But if you are ready to die to self and live for the benefit of another, there can be peace. And that is the Christian life. The Christian life is a death and a life all at the same time. Death to self and life in Christ is the entrance into the Christian life. And the Christian life lived out in the body of Christ is a continual death to self and living unto others. And what you find is real vibrant life with one another in the body of Christ. A second elusive thing we are to pursue is mutual edification. Notice what Paul says in verse 19. We pursue the things which make for the building up of one another. Building up of one another. Edification. The constructing of an edifice. Now, what are the things that make for the building up of one another? These are the things that promote the vitality of Christian living, the vitality of Godward affections and Christward living in one another. Where we spur one another on to love and to good deeds. Where we are eager as individual parts operating correctly, but joined together in the vital union of body life, causing the growth of the body, Ephesians 4.16. That is how the body is built up. That is how the church grows. And we are to do this for one another. And listen, the weak and the strong help each other grow in Christ's likeness and maturity when they intersect with each other in areas of indifference. Areas where we might disagree about certain applications of things. You see, the strong grow by learning and relearning what it is to have a tender conscience when they interact with a weak brother who says, Ooh, I can't eat bacon. I grew up under Mosaic law. And the strong Christian who's been eating BLTs for years says, Oh, I want that tender conscience. I want to be sensitive to the things of the Lord that way. It is so refreshing and and so sweet to be around someone who I just want to please the Lord. And I'm not sure what that all looks like yet. I haven't read my whole Bible and I'm still working it out, but I just want to be careful. Oh, strong believers need that all over again. And we grow in our maturity in Christ by being around each other as we wrestle these things out. And how do the weak grow? They they grow by having their consciences informed. But, But maybe they grow even more by learning from the example of the strong as the strong lay down, as they set aside their own preferences in love for the benefit of others. Can the weak grow from the strong when the strong love them selflessly? Yes. And so there is mutual edification. Why are we to pursue these things? Well, because peace is not automatic. Peace is elusive because we're different. And it's almost as if God knew that we would be so different from one another that we would need to be commanded to chase after peace. And we're commanded to pursue edification because the building up of one another doesn't come easy. It is elusive as well. Look, it's easy to tear things down. It's difficult to build them up. Remember when you made that long chain of dominoes and it took you four hours to get it 97% complete and then your kid brother came over and went... (laughs) And the whole thing went down in seconds. Look, it can take decades to build a skyscraper and mere seconds to bring it to a pile of rubble. It's easy to tear down. It's so easy to be a wrecking ball in the body of Christ. It is so difficult, laborious, faith-filled plodding to build one another up. It takes persistent, enduring love to build one another up. Easy 
to tear down. And so we must pursue, chase after edification like it's elusive. That leads to the second command here. It's in verse 20. Don't destroy the work of God. Don't destroy the work of God. It builds on what we just looked at. It's the opposite of edification. It is the tearing down. This prohibition is against the tearing down of God's work. Don't tear down the work of God. And the work of God here can be seen either as his work in an individual Christian, i.e. the weaker brother, um, or even the tearing down of the work of God, which is the church corporately. And I think when we tear down a weaker brother, we are in fact tearing down the church corporately. We are members of one another. And when one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. Listen to God's work described in the individual Christian, Philippians 2. My beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. What is the work of God in the life of the individual believer? It is God by His power producing a desire and an energy and the resources, the equipping to do what pleases Him. Who's working in the Christian life? Is it God or is it you? Yes. God by His supernatural power is enabling you, Christian, to work, to do what is pleasing to Him. That is God's work in the individual Christian. And then God's work in the church is displayed for us in many places. But Ephesians 2 says this, You are no longer strangers and aliens. You are fellow citizens with the saints, and you are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself, the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom also you are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. All of those verbs there are passive verbs. You are being built. Who's doing the building? This is a divine passive. God does the work of building up the church, building up the body of Christ. And the prohibition here in Romans 14 is do not tear down that work. Don't tear down that work. How precious is this work? How otherworldly is this work, the supernatural work of God in the life of a believer, the supernatural work of God in a group of diverse believers together in the local body? Don't tear it down. You might be thinking, well, how could I tear down something so grand and glorious as the work of God? Surely I can't thwart God's purposes. Well, listen, God uses means to accomplish His purposes, and you can actually be a means of thwarting God's intent for an individual Christian or for the church. Listen, spiritual ruin is what running over your conscience aims at, tends toward. And I want you to think about the mechanics of how this works. When you sin against what you know to be right before God, when you transgress some command of God or intentionally neglect some, um, or you cross some prohibition or intentionally neglect some command of God, and you don't deal with that sin, you sear your conscience, you, you flatten out the sharp edges of the discomfort internally about sin about your relationship to God. And if you get comfortable with that, the pathway gets easier. The rough edges are smoother. It's easier to sin again in that area. You create ruts in which it's easier to travel. And you do that again without confronting that sin, dealing with that sin, putting that sin to death, and you make the road smoother, and you sear the conscience further eventually that conscience becomes calloused in that area. And the end result of that will be, I read my Bible, I rehearsed the gospel, and I still sinned in this way. I guess it doesn't matter. 
wait, I guess the gospel doesn't work. I guess Bible reading isn't effective. <laughs> Have you ever spun that in your own mind and gotten to the place where I'm, I'm sinning again, the gospel doesn't work? <laughs> and, and you blame your inability to put sin to death on the supernatural res- resources that God supplies for that very thing. And the end of that road is apostasy. You go from saying in a moment as a professing Christian, the gospel's not working. The Bible's not working. To, I'm going to stop reading my Bible. I'm going to stop thinking about substitutionary atonement. I'm going to quit trying to put sin to death. And you normalize sin, you get comfortable with sin, and my friend, the show is over. That is the pathway to apostasy. Walk away from Christ altogether. And then you can say, been there, done that, ex-evangelical. That is a tragedy. Spiritual ruin is what running over your conscience is aiming at. It is the trajectory Right? The trajectory is a line with an arrow on it on the end. It crosses a number of planes in the same direction or at the same angle. It's headed that way. It's a measurement not only of direction, but time. And, and you give that heart direction time, and it will walk away completely from Christ. You will prove yourself never to have been a believer at all. And the protection from that is bound up in how we relate to one another and how you keep short accounts with God, and how you deal with sin. And the factor that Paul zeroes in on here as a factor for spiritual ruin of professing believers is the careless use of liberties by so-called mature Christians. If you think you're a mature Christian because you can eat a BLT and you're not giving thought to your brother who can't, you are putting his soul in danger. That's the point. And notice how Paul concludes this little clause, verse 19, I'm sorry, verse 20. Don't tear down the work of God for food. Do you see it? What a trifle. What a little thing for a sandwich. Don't tear him down for food. Do you remember someone who gave up everything for a bowl of red stew? Remember Esau, sold his birthright for lunch. What a tragedy that we would put other Christians in Esau's position. Christian, don't do it. Here's the third command, the second half of verse 20. Learn to discern what's good and bad. And this covers verse 20, uh, the second half, and then through verse 21. Paul says, all things indeed are clean, but they're evil. And then in verse 21, and it's good to not to. (laughs) Learn to discern what is good and what's bad. And it's not just as simple as a list. What's on limits and what's off limits. But notice the progression here. Second half of verse 20, all things indeed are clean. And Paul says, all things are pure. Uh, the word there is pure, and it relates to the ceremonial cleanliness now, out from under Mosaic law, of foods that were formerly unclean. And Paul is saying lobster's clean, bacon's clean, all the things that were off the list bat, hoopy, camel, if you want. And it's also a, 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 a strike at the whole idea of market meat from idols. Idol is nothing. The meat you get from the market, it's clean. You can eat it with gratitude. Paul is siding here with the strong on the truth about food. It's good. Everything is to be received with gratitude to God and enjoy. So it's good. And then he says, it's bad, (laughs) but they are evil. Wait, I I thought you just said it was pure, it was clean, it was on the menu, now it's evil. (laughs) Yes, it's evil 
for the man, literally, for the man eating unto offense. Now, whether that's the weak man eating and offending God because he's running over his own conscience, or it's the strong man eating without thought of his brother and ruining him spiritually. It's evil. It's evil eating good things unto offense. And then in verse 21, Paul says, it's good. (laughs) What's good? It's good not to eat meat, not to drink wine, not to do anything by which your brother stumbles. And he gives three separate categories here. It's good not to eat meat. It's good not to meet. It's good to abstain from meat eating. That's what we read earlier in 1 Corinthians 8. It's good to limit your own exercise of legitimate freedoms. It's good to do that for the sake of your brother. And he said it's good not to drink wine. And, and the wine here, I think, is specifically a reference to libations. Uh, Maybe you've heard alcoholic drinks referred to as libations. Uh, Libation is a word used to refer to alcohol that was uh, purchased or acquired specifically to pour out onto the ground in front of a deity as pagan ritual worship. Uh, There was drunkenness involved, but the libation was a to the idol first. (laughs) And so this drinking of wine here is tainted again with uh, idolatrous practices that the people that were reading this letter had been involved in to great measure prior to knowing Christ. And if you haven't been reinformed in your conscience about idolatry, this would be problematic. And so Paul says, I'm not going to drink wine at all if it causes my brother to stumble. And then, of course, the last one, don't eat meat, don't drink wine, Or do anything by which your brother stumbles. This is just the catch-all category. (laughs) That helps us understand that the principle expands beyond idolatrous meat and drink. But we're thinking about our brother in these areas of indifference. And we're seeking to love him. Which requires putting self to death. Which requires limiting the exercise of my own legitimate liberties. Listen to Paul's example of self-limitation for the benefit of others. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. Though I am free from all, I have made myself a slave to all so that I might win more. Again, in 1 Corinthians 10, 24. Let no one seek his own good but that of his neighbor. 1 Corinthians 10, 33. Just as I also please men in all things, not seeking my own profit but the profit of the many. And many have misunderstood Paul's claim to be as others in their company, right? And they've taken that to be, when in Rome, do as the Romans. Dress like they dress, eat like they eat, talk like they talk, believe like they believe. You're around sailors, use sailor vocabulary. That was not Paul's message. Paul's being like others was a self-limitation so as not to cause offense, so as not to misrepresent Christ. Paul was not saying, I get to be as free as the people around me. Paul was saying, I get to enslave myself for the benefit of everyone around me. This is mature Christianity. Fourth command, it's found in verse 22. Be convinced privately before God. Notice how Paul says this. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. The faith which you possess, possess it literally, to yourself and before God. This is personal, persuaded conviction, not held out in the open, not broadcast. This is not where you uh, think through your own personal Christian liberties before God. I can enjoy this before God, have gratitude and worship Him in it and enjoy it for His glory and put it on Instagram. (laughs) No, this is keep it to yourself. By faith here, Paul does not mean saving belief. By the faith, he doesn't mean the gospel. Paul here is not saying keep your faith to yourself and keep the gospel to yourself. 
Faith here is that confident assurance that what you feel free to do as a Christian is actually a legitimate liberty before God, approved by God, pleasing to the Lord. That's what he means by faith here. And that faith you possess in that legitimate freedom area, possess it to yourself. Possess it privately. Don't flaunt it. This is not for public consumption. Why? Because you actually have to protect your brother or sister in the Lord. Who's not there yet? You have to think about others. And to say that we do this to unto ourselves and before God is a reminder that there's a check on my assumption about a liberty. God's always the audience. He sees the motives. He sees right through the heart. He sees right through the motivation, right through the thought process. He knows if what I really want to do is just get away with something and, and put a Bible verse on it or, or uh, put no Bible verses on it so that I'm free to do it and I could just want to do it. He sees through all of that. He's always the audience. You carry these things with full persuaded confidence before the Lord. And if you can't be grateful to Him, if you can't, whatever you do, eat or drink, do all to the glory of God, then it's not legitimate. And this is a reminder that He is our primary audience. We are accountable to Him. We must do these things as worship pleasing to Him. And while God is always your audience, your brother doesn't have to be. There's a fifth command, second half of verse 22. Exercise care in what you approve. Paul writes, happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. Happy, blessed. There's a, there's a good result, a beneficial result, a personal experiential goodness in you following this command. Don't condemn yourself in what you approve. Don't put yourself in a situation by testing something, trying something out, and then letting it pass the test that later you find out, ooh, God's not pleased with that. There was a principle I overlooked. There, there was a verse I didn't know, and I just ran headlong into what I thought was a liberty and found out later it was sin. Have you ever done that? Be careful about that. You, you're blessed, you're happy if you don't do that. The word condemned here, the, the condemnation described, uh, this is a word that often describes eschatological condemnation, that is ultimate disaster in the lake of fire under God's just judgment. I don't believe that's what Paul has in view here. I think he's talking about a behavior that is condemnable by God. But don't misunderstand, if you perpetually engage in condemnable behaviors, that again is the pathway to apostasy and you may find yourself condemned eschatologically. This is serious business. Be careful what you test and approve. And for the weak, this is important, the, the weak might rashly approve of some behavior that is not warranted from confidence in the Scriptures. Maybe the weak looks around at my Christian brothers and sisters and they're all doing something that I feel like is wrong, but because of peer pressure, I'm just going to do it. I'm actually accountable to God for that sin. Don't succumb to Christian culture as the measure of the standard of what it means to be pleasing to the Lord. For the strong... You could brashly parade your freedom without giving thought to your brother. That is condemnable behavior. Listen to Proverbs 20, 25. It is a trap for a man to say rashly, it's holy, and after he's made his vows to make inquiry. This is the look before you leap principle. Investigate. Christian, it means you're going to have to know your Bible. Keep reading. Keep seeking to bring your life into conformity with the way Jesus Christ regulates the Christian life. And look, you find your life to be happy and blessed when you do that. Two ways to fall under this kind of condemnation, to sin personally against your conscience or to cause a brother to stumble. And that leads to the last uh, command here in this text. When in doubt, leave it out. Verse 23. He who doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. 
To doubt here is to waver back and forth in your judgment. Uh, There's a bit of a play on words in the original here. Lots of judgment vocabulary. This is, I'm judging it one day to be okay, one day to be next. I'm not settled, but I'm going to go ahead and eat. If you eat while wavering about whether or not it is right, you are sinning. Look, (laughs) even if on, on Tuesday you think a BLT is okay to eat, and you eat it, but Monday and Wednesday, you don't think it's okay. You're sinning. Even though you're right about the thing theologically, you're sinning because you're not eating from faith. You're eating while wavering in doubt. It's sin. And the verb here for condemned gives the idea of uh, this one will have stood condemned. By the time you do this, you're demonstrating that this was already condemnable behavior. It reminds us of what Paul says of the Apostle Peter in Galatians 2.11. Remember, Peter was enticed by the Judaizers to refuse table fellowship with Gentiles. And Paul says he confronted Peter to his face and Peter stood condemned. That doesn't mean Peter was going to hell. But it does mean he was already standing in a position of having done condemnable behavior and he needed to be confronted. So look before you leap. Know your Bible. Be fully convinced. Be pleasing to the Lord. Again, if it's not done from worship and gratitude, it should not be done. And notice how Paul closes this section. Everything that is not from faith is sin. And so he broadens this clearly from a specific application of meat sacrificed to idols to all of these in different areas. Paul makes it clear that this set of principles has application to an expansive range of areas that we face in the Christian life. We'll come to some more of the principles that he deals with in chapter 15. But what a kindness of God to the church that he gives us instructions that force us to think outside of ourselves and to look around and think about others. Jesus said, the world will know that you belong to me by your love for one another. This is an application of that very thing. What the world ought to see in the church is the kind of unity that happens when people who are very different lay down their lives for each other in love. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you, of course, are the best example of laying down your life for those whom you loved. We think about what it means that you took on flesh, became a baby at Bethlehem, having already existed from eternity past, and now in time appearing to rescue us from ourselves from this world, from Satan, from darkness, from the slavery of sin, and ultimately from the wrath of your Father, which we so richly deserved. And now we are beneficiaries of your love and your kindness and the unspeakable riches of your mercy, which we will enjoy for all of eternity. We praise you for these things. We sing about them even now in your name. Amen.